So we just come before our God and pray before we open up. Our Father, we thank you this morning for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for a Saviour who loved us, one who came that we might live. We thank you also for the Holy Spirit who lives in us, and we do pray that as we open your scriptures that he might just encourage us to understand, that he might give us that sense of your presence in our hearts that we might know more of the scriptures that we might have wisdom to discern it that we might have ability to share it now father this morning we do thank you for at this time we can spend together in your word we thank you for all that it has given us uh, day by day we do pray that we might use it we might dwell upon it that we might be thankful for it Father, now bless us as we open your word in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. I just want to open this, the reading from Psalm 65. The title in my Bible is Praise to God for His Salvation and Providence. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, a song. Praise is waiting awaiting you, O God, in Zion, and to you the vow shall be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Iniquities prevail against me, as for our transgressions, you will provide an atonement for them. I'm thinking something of that this morning. Blessed is a man who you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple, by awesome deeds in righteousness. You will answer us, O God of our salvation. You who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of the far-off seas, who establishes the mountains by his strength, being clothed with power, you who still the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. They also who dwell in the farthest parts are afraid of your signs. You make the outgoings of the morning and the evening rejoice. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, and for so you have prepared it. You water its ridges abundantly. You settle its furrows. You make it soft with showers. You bless its growth. You crown the year with your goodness and your paths drip with abundance. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered with grain. They shout for joy. They also sing. What a wonderful God we have as we come into this morning to our passage in Colossians it was those words at the start of this psalm you who hear prayer comes to mind I just thought I'd read something of the wonder of our God and who we pray to and the goodness we should be thankful for as we consider him let's turn to Colossians chapter 4 and we'll begin at verse 2 Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Lord, allow a blessing for the reading of his word. 
Last week we considered the effect of the new creation in the family, the responsibility and the accountability of each, and the ultimate responsibility of the husband in the home. The Apostle writes to the mother, the child and the servant and encourages them in their roles. But the husband is written to three times. On each occasion, as his responsibility for the family falls upon him. The service within the home. We consider the actions of service, and like the bondservant or slave, we are to work as to God, who sees and knows all. Not to please men. And we're reminded at the end of the chapter that it is God who will repay all the injustice and the wrongs without any partiality to earthly position and power. There's no getting away from it. There is no hiding from it. His judgment and justice is right. It's just and final because he judges the unseen, the heart and the motive. I want this week to move on to the service for others and from others outside the home. We so often consider that there is not much we can do in service for the Lord and probably as we get older that becomes a greater burden as time and age takes its toll on our minds and bodies. We are less able to move about with freedom. We are less able to remember things, less able to get out and about and meet people as easily as when we were young. And often it is difficult even to get out to any of the meetings as health and ability and energy begins to fail. Despite all the real issues that age or ill health may bring, there is one area of service that is open to all 24 hours a day, seven days a week, year in, year out. Prayer. We read in Psalm 65 verse 2, O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Psalm chapter 121, 3 says, He will not allow your foot to be moved. He keeps you, will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Doesn't matter when we pray. Doesn't matter what time that is. The wee small hours of the morning or the middle of the day, our God doesn't slumber or sleep. He hears prayer. Prayer is the one action that the weakest and smallest and most insignificant saint can be effective in. It is the same God that we have thought of as the one who is on our side, who is at our side. He enables us. He teaches us. Who has given his Holy Spirit to dwell within us. It is this God who the psalmist promised Israel that he neither slumbers nor sleeps. And if to Israel, how much more to those bought with the precious blood of the Saviour. When we call upon him, he is always alert for the feeblest cry, the weakest groan, the boldest call. He is never not available. There is no please press key one for this. Sorry, the lines are busy. We are sorry, we cannot take your call at this time. Our God is fully awake and knows our needs before we do, but loves to converse with us loves to acknowledge our needs and thanks wants to know about the things we've thought about what we have we should be giving him thanks like the opening of that song we met this morning to express our thanks for the son and all that he is because uh, we have been considering him during the week and have come thankful and in wonder again at his grace love and mercy see our God is not some distant being that cannot hear that needs rest 
or has to be awoken or come looking for us if we take time to speak to him he listens <coughs> and he answers we're never in a place of I hope he heard that or do you think he's listening he is always this is the confidence we can have in him every moment of every day there is no maybe there is no need to cry louder as Elijah encouraged the false, the false priests at the altar on Mount Carmel in the Old Testament that they may, what might wake up the God that he might be otherwise engaged and need a louder noise to encourage him to listen to them but when Elijah called there was no wait no come and wait and see what happened the offering that he made was consumed with the stone altar and the gallons of water that were round about it God answered and then some we come before the same God every day and his power is not diminished one little bit as the apostle now begins to sum up this letter to the Colossians having encouraged them to continue in their spiritual walk and growth in the new creation he comes back to that great powerhouse of Christian faith our prayer in verse 2 he says continue earnestly in prayer being vigilant in it with thanksgiving the apostle has real confidence in these people of God real encouragement in their salvation and in their living faith and its impact on their lives and he encourages them to continue this could mean to start at the point of receiving this letter and then keep praying but I would suggest he's encouraged them <coughs> to keep on praying as they have been doing up until receiving this letter the word like those we considered last week is an imperative one that is important and to be attended to a command what follows is vital and important and requires constancy and consideration it is a real joy for Paul to write to these men and women children and slaves knowing that they are praying and encouraging them to keep up the practice of prayer they are asked to ensure three things to be earnest the idea is in a serious and a determined way we to pray seriously and determinedly this is not some ca casual passing by comment flippant in nature with throw lines and no consideration of the outcome and the position of the one we come before it does not mean prescribed and set language but our prayer should be done with respect and consideration for the person we are approaching whose power built the world and all in it and who has the keys of death and hell and the power over them we need to be thoughtful about our demeanor when we approach God we should take time before to seek those things which we should pray for to make a list if we need to to have a deep desire for the things we pray for and that they may fully come to fruition we should be earnestly believing that he is able to bring about his will in a situation to change those things that are happening to give strength we needed to grant wisdom and help when appropriate but there is that sense in which we must approach in seriousness and in faith and be asking for those things that are in his will and for his glory but we're also told to be vigilant essentially it means to watch but with much more depth to it the Greek English dic dictionary gives us this consideration gives strict attention to be cautious active to take heed lest through remission and indolence some describe destructive calamity overtakes you the language is very old-fashioned and put simply we're to beware and to be aware that prayer is for our good and blessing 
and that of others and not paying attention to it can have serious consequences. I'm sure that many of us concur with that sentiment. It is the idea of being aware that there is a need to pray in the first instance. And in continuing in prayer, we are to ensure that we do not get lazy. That we continue to look for things that are going on around us that we should be praying for. Being aware of the effects of the world around, of the situations that are happening daily, of the effect of the world on our lives, of our need to, consist, to be consistent and earnest, of ensuring we make the time for prayer and the consideration of the things we should pray for, for people, for government, for work and, and what, that which is being done, for the lost, for the church and local and worldwide. The list is long and we need to be vigilant. The list is ever changing lest we forget and let it slip, lest we forget the purpose, lest we lose sight of the power of it or the ability of the one to whom we pray to bring about those results. It doesn't mean we can't send up short prayers in time of need or a quick cry for help when we have the opportunity to witness and are struggling for words or not sure how to help another. But there must be times of settled and considered prayer. Time alone with our Father. With thanksgiving. What a timely reminder in an age where it can seem that it's all about me. The Apostle reminds the Colossians that we, are, that we only can pray to God if all things because we have been given and been brought into his kingdom. We've been redeemed by the blood of Christ and that gives us access to God. How thankful should our prayers be? With our salvation, none of the blessings promised in the scripture can be ours. And we have been given the perfect platform to express that thanks through prayer. All we have and will have in glory we have because we have been given it. It is the free gift, and any reward for our efforts are because He is loving and a caring God and desires that we come to Him, that we walk with Him, that we share His good news with others, and He promises to help us do it. Thanks must be to God and to His honour and glory for all His benefits to us. We saw that in that psalm when he, when he goes on to express just who, what God has done for the world, feeding and keeping and watering it, and everything that expresses from that. It is interesting to see that Paul sets out uh, for the believers as he does. It is that wonder of the challenge to share that we have, of what we have learned and what we do. So much of our Christian life is spent learning and adding to our knowledge. So often we forget, we can forget to add it to our application as well. Paul started the book by telling the people of Colossae uh, that he and those with him in Rome gave thanks to God, praying always for them, being vigilant in other words, since we heard of your faith, they were looking at what they could pray for. They took note and they recognized the marks of the love of, of, of all the saints by the people of Colossians. Markers of salvation that they were vigilant to. Their hope, their fruit, their witness through Epaphras, who Paul was with him as he writes. Because of those things, those who Paul is surrounded by not, do not cease to pray for them and their growth and understanding. Earnest, serious prayer is applied to them, these Christians in, Colossian, in Colossae, when you reread what Paul is asking for them in his prayer. Meanwhile, praying for, verse 3, meanwhile praying also for us that God would open to us 
a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. In verse 3, Paul, who had made his request for the saints known to God, asks for reciprocal prayer. He is asking them to add those in Rome to their prayer list, not to cut another out, but also to pray for those in Rome. Now many who are in Paul's situation may have requested prayer that the door that God would open would be the one out of the cell or to the new home or to freedom or just the release from the chains. But he shows the discipline of his desire to serve the Lord is not in the comfort of his own home or even his freedom or the relaxing of the guards or the ability to return home to Antioch or to Jerusalem or to train the believers elsewhere. But his request for them is aligned with his that they be given opportunity to present the word of God, wherever that may be. He was in chains because of his telling out of the good news of the gospel, and he had many scars to prove the power and to, to prove the power it has to cause consternation and to cause people to want revenge and anger at the message and the effect it can have on those who believe and those who do not. And despite all that, he asks for prayer, for the opportunity to share more, no matter if the consequences are good or bad, no matter if it brings them back into a similar situation or worse. He's hopeful in being free to do it, but content to leave it in God's hand and reach those who are around him at the time, building the faith and teaching of those who were imprisoned with him and those who were able to visit him while in chains. There is a real sense of, of, of expectation, waiting for the Lord to open up the next door of opportunity to go through it and find where the Lord would have him to share the mystery that is the love of God to men expressed in and through our Lord Jesus Christ and his death, his burial and his resurrection. That is some mystery. He is not sitting in jail moping about his situation, complaining that he did not deserve it and why would God let this happen to him given all the effort he's put in and all the trials he's already been through. Rather, he's inviting these fellow Christians to join with him in prayer for guidance and wisdom in where he would go next to speak and share the good news, to seek God on behalf of those with him in Rome for the future, to point others to his beloved Lord, that they too can know what it is that he has that makes him willing to be set aside for the gospel's sake. What privilege is given to us day by day in prayer. The door that is open for us may be difficult and cause us to be set aside as Paul was. Are we, am I, as willing to go as these men were? I would also remind us that there were still doors being opened to Christians that put them in chains, in danger, in the grave today. It has always been there. There are always those that God calls to a work that they are prepared for, even if they don't know it. And there are many martyrs that we have evidence of down the years. There are many that we will not know and see until glory, who gave their lives for the Lord. The Lord said to the rich young ruler when he had given up all he had and given to the poor, in Mark chapter 10 verse 21, And come, take up the cross and follow me. No promise of an easy life. Plenty of promises of one who, is full, who will fulfill abundantly and support comprehensively if we take up our cross and follow him. Verse 4 says, That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. His greatest desire is to share the mystery of Christ to make manifest or visible or known what has been hidden or has been made or has or is unknown. 
But I note he does not ask for a prayer for himself only, as he, as if he is the top gun, the one out, cut out of the for the work, and he alone, the one who should be held up. Rather, it is the perfect desire of the shared role that all are involved and require the prayer and blessing and help of God in their endeavours. Look how many times Paul, Paul uses we and us and those with me in his writings. Undoubtedly, he needed prayer. But so do we all. But not just to share it, but to share it as, the, as it ought to be shared. To share the, the love and the word of God, lovingly and tenderly, carefully, fully, not skipping out the tough stuff. It's not easy to present the gospel effectively sometimes and it takes the preparation so that when the time arises we are ready for the words that we are able to deliver through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul recognizes the help he needs and asks others to share in the power of the work in the enjoyment of seeing souls saved through the work of another knowing that our God hears our prayer on the behalf of the speaker and the sinner and that he is able to open their eyes and touch their conscience that his spirit can convict the darkest soul and bring light what a wonderful privilege we have to pray earnestly and vigilantly for those who are working for the Lord around the world and at home. These believers were hundreds of miles away from Rome, but the prayer of all was heard by the same God and the same Spirit raised them up. It almost feels like Paul and the others were struggling to find those who could, they could witness and share the gospel with because they were chained and imprisoned. And yet they continue to seek the help and direction of God. They were certain that he would open a door. Not maybe not sure when, but he would. Paul and those with him are trying many doors in their desire to to be to witness to others, to continue to share. They're not sitting idly by, waiting for someone to come and be witnessed to, but are actively seeking to speak to those who God will allow them to speak to. He wants a door opened. But in the meantime, they would continue to knock on doors. God would open the right one. When it opened, they were fully prepared to go through it, no matter what the cost. He's using his downtime in prison and in chains to consider how to present the mystery of Christ when the door is opened. I came across this quote from John Bunyan while I was studying for, for today and thought it was a wonderful description of the act of worship and devotion that is involved in prayer. Prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Spirit for such things as God has promised. And what things God has promised us. We cannot, run, we cannot run out of things to pray for. His promises never end. And he hears us and he, it is his delight that we come to him. And he loves to fulfill his will through the prayer of his saints and the work of his saints. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 to 8, the Lord Jesus uses a parable to illustrate the consistent nature of prayer. Describing a widow uh, who consistently pesters a judge uh, to get her justice. The judge did not think much upon it at first and thought she would go away. However, the widow continues to hassle him for a judgment. Eventually he gives in and she gets the judgment she continually asks for. Jesus used this to illustrate his opening statement in the chapter. In verse 1 he said, Then he spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not to lose heart. His point was that the woman never gave up in her quest to get a judgment against her adversary. 
And in like manner, we're not to give up praying for what is right, for what we have considered vigilantly. The answer may not come immediately. <coughs> it may come next week, next year, or in the next decade, but it is still worth praying for consistently. There is evidence of those safe by faith, saved by the faithful and continuous prayer of the saints, whether it be family or friends, or situations or troubles. We are to keep praying until we get the answer, which of course precludes that we are being earnest and vigilant, and most of all, listening. Paul asked three times that a thorn in the flesh that he might that he might have it be removed, and it wasn't. His conclusion? God's grace sufficient to enable him to cope with it. The response of one who trusts God in all things. With God, that sometimes my attitude was the same. Jesus comment at the end of the, the verse was at the end of that passage was this. In verse 7 he says, And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? See, the answer to prayer may be long in coming, but there is no doubt they are heard and will be answered. Do not give up praying for what is right and good. Most importantly, in faith and trust. We should expect answers. If we are praying faithfully and, tr and trusting our God, we should expect answers. But be aware, sometimes it might be no. Other times it might be wait. Other times it might be instant yes. As we end this short section where Paul elevates prayer to the top of our daily to-do list in life, I'm constantly reminded that so many of the greatest prayer prayers I have ever met are those that, struggle, those that struggle with advancing years. Their prayer is covered in thanks and love and depth of vision for the things that others may need. And they spend hours considering vigilantly the things that they should pray for and for the opportunity of others. It is a treasure and blessing to know that we are on the list of those who pray earnestly, of those who pray for us vigilantly. And as we end this short, short section where Paul elevates prayer to the top of our daily list, I'm constantly reminded that we need to pray. Verse 5 says this, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time walk. Paul switches his attention back to the Colossian believers and his request for, after his request for prayer and their prayer and what they should be doing. It is certainly not something he can do freely as he is in chains. The word is once again an imperative, something we're commanded to do. To walk means that we need to go out and about, outdoors. It means to go amongst those who surround us. But it's not just a stroll for our health or our well-being that is in view. But it is, to be with, it is to be with purpose, with a desire to achieve something. It is in wisdom, having a broad view of all that goes on around, of having thought through the issues of the day, of how to wisely and effectively deal with the people and the world around us, to those who are outside of the grace of saving faith, to those who are lost. It is important that we have some consideration of the situation of others, to be vigilant, to understand the challenges we face and that those in the world face with us, but so often they face them without God. Our walk should reflect our faith, our trust in God, and should be gentle and caring, seeking to help those who are in need. It is often seen in the history of our land that much of the greatest charity work set up early on began with the work of Christians, 
men and women who saw need and sought to help. It is still true today. It is still a challenge of what can I help in. It is easy to put ourselves in that I can't help category. I don't know what to do. We're to walk in wisdom. Walking in wisdom takes time, effort, thought. It takes persistence. It takes seeking God's will. But it is active. It's not done sitting at home. We need to go out to help those who are in trouble. But we need to have spent time understanding how we help and the consequences of it so we can be effective. The verse finishes with those words so often we hear, redeeming the time. Using the time we have to the best advantage, or as, one, as, as Strong's Concordance puts it, to make wise and sacred use of every, every opportunity for doing good, along with a number of other uh, things to think about. We are to use our time wisely in the service of our Saviour. We began this section with what, it, what is perhaps the greatest use of our time, prayer. But we need to go out, we need to recognize, sorry, we need to display the wisdom of God that is ours in our walk. Our walk should display the love of God in the things we do, in the effort we take to care for those we meet, and those we work with, and those we work for. Like that servant we thought of last week, we are to ensure that our standards of work and outside the home reflect the God we serve. Verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to, you ought to answer each one. And finally, finally, after those points that he's made above, we have permitted to speak. All the previous notes bring us to this point. But it's not just free speech that we are to indulge in. Our walk and our words will have a mighty effect on those around. The first instruction here is always. Like the commands, the imperatives we have seen through this book, so is our speech to be controlled. It was the writer James in his book who said the tongue is small, but boasts great things and it sets fires going is a world of iniquity and no man can tame it in chapter 3 of his book how often is a response not the right one not the considered one our speech should always be with grace and again I went to Strong's Concordance and, and, came, and it came up with this that that which affords joy Pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, loveliness, grace of speech. How we reply, the conversations we join in, the responses we make, our comments to others, the comments about others, the tales we tell, the languages and the words we use should all be seasoned with salt or with grace. They should all be set out to bring out the best, to expound the good, to bring peace, to raise the level of conversation, to ensure that those we meet recognize that our speech, like Peter's at the high priest court, betrays us as one of God's, that we are different, and that we are considered in our conversation, and it makes us stand out for good. Seasoned with salt, Salt is used to enhance flavour, to purify, to bring out the best and remove the worst. What a wonderful picture we are given of how our speech should be. But if you spare me, and in but is you spare me, and in the day when Paul was writing, was of great value. What we say should be seasoned with what we have thought about, what we have prayed about. Our conversation should have the love of God running through it. There should, there should not be too much of it, as too much salt can also ruin a thing and overpower it. But what is said should be considered before the words leave our mouths. How many times have you heard that statement, engage, engage, engage brain before speaking? 
if only we were more careful at times. Too little salt, too few words may leave the conversation insipid or stilted and people wondering or not sure of our desire to share the grace of God. It may mean missed opportunity. Words can do considerable damage and we see and hear of things said daily from those around us and on the news that many wish had not been said. There have been many in the last few days who wish their written words had not been recorded uh, and as they were exposed for all to see. But the idea of consideration that brings th that the, the things that Paul has been encouraging throughout this book that changes and modifies our speech. The preeminence of Christ. The placing of the Holy Spirit within. The wisdom and availability of guidance and help for all who call upon him. The call to learn and study. To look at the scriptures and to apply them. The new creation and the changes it brings. The prayer time, the vigilance, the expect expectation of opportunity to share our faith and to change life. All these bring about the ability to know how to answer each person, each question, each challenge that comes as we move around the world. In summary, these are the five things set up by Paul in this section that are guides for life. <coughs> One that Christ fulfilled and Paul has set out to describe for us in his own life. Pray earnestly. It is vital and brings vitality. It's the starting point of our new life, for it is in prayer that we come before God and seek, and seek and seeking forgiveness for our sin and confess our sin to, to Him. Here is where we begin and end and complete our day. Earnest, vigil, and vigilant, thankful prayer. Vigilant or watchful, we need to look and see what needs our prayer's attention and ensure that we bring it to Him. We need to see the things and the people and the places that require the touch of the Lord upon them. It is time consuming and difficult sometimes, but it is required and it is rewarding. When we can see the challenges and the pitfalls, the door that is open, then we can enter with confidence because we have been vigilant in prayer and in seeking His guidance. We are to look and see. Not only are we to pray and be watchful, but we are to wait expectantly, seeking for the door that will be opened for us to speak and share the mystery of Christ, the gospel of the good news of salvation. But we are to ensure it is a door opened by God, not one we have decided to kick down, one that we've decided to force open, or one that is opened by another to deceive us if we're not watchful in prayer in the first case in understanding God's will for us having prayed and watched and waited we are to walk wisely which goes back to making sure the door we enter is the right one <coughs> those who surround us are constantly looking at the way we live at the issues that we face and how we deal with them and the things we say and do there will be those who will seek to make us fall to make us waste make waste of our testimony of the goodness of God to us and the changes he has brought and finally we are to speak gracefully having prayed earnestly and vigilantly having been watchful in prayer and in life and observing the path of life carefully having waited expectantly so that we know which way the good shepherd would guide us having demonstrated the reality of the love of God in our own lives to those around. Finally, we are, prepared, we are prepared by Him through the Spirit and the knowledge that He has given us to speak a word in season and out of season. In other words, when there are times it appears that all is going well and there are those who are happy to listen and discuss where there is no animosity or anger and just as much when there is opposition and anger and pressure to keep silent, to not stand up and be counted, 
when the message we bear may mean like Paul, we end up in chains or opposed. But we are still to share the mystery with all when the door is opened in a gracious and loving way. I am reminded as I look at the order that speaking requires preparation and is last on his list. So often we can dive in where angels fear to tread without the due consideration and prayer and observation. I'll just finish on the, these words from Ephesians, chapter 3 and verse 20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, and to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Shall we pray? Our Father, we do thank you for the words of Paul in this book to the Colossians. We are so grateful for these reminders of all that we have in Christ. We thank you for that reminder of the need of prayer. We thank you for the power of prayer. We thank you for the one that we come before in prayer who is all powerful. We thank you for that psalm that reminded us of the power of our God. Our Father, we thank you that all men will bow before him one day. Our Father, we do pray that day by day you will encourage us, you enable us to think about the things that we need to pray about, to look for those things that we should be praying for, to wait expectantly for the areas that you will open to us, to have a deep desire day by day to share with some, share with one, something of the love of God. Enable us to prepare our hearts. We thank you for the Holy Spirit within. We do pray that as we walk and as we talk, we might reflect the love of God in our lives. We thank you that we are the salt of the earth, that we are that light, that light on a hill. Enable us to shine, enable us to share with others, that we might see souls saved. Father, as we go into the week, we pray for health and strength. We do pray for your goodness and your help with us. We do pray that you would, until you come, give us that wisdom that we require. We pray for those who are unwell this time. Ask that you would just encourage. We lift up Winston and Barbara and Nikki to you, Lord, and just pray that they would continue to know your strength. For each one of us, Lord, we do pray that you uh, will encourage us to pray for one another faithfully, uh, to be faithful in looking what each other needs, and to be thankful that we have such a wonderful God, that we can share in all things that he has given. Father, now take us to our homes in safety, encourage us, and enable us and enlighten us. For we ask these things in your Son's precious name. Amen. Mm -hmm.